Welcome to the Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton. We have two pushy boys here today, Manny and Mark. And our very special guest we have today is Dean Ray. Now, Dean, as most of you will know, is an Australian singer and songwriter who was the runner-up in the sixth season of X Factor Australia. He um, has done amazing tours. He's done releases all across the country and is an incredibly popular um, artist, one that we've worked with for the last couple of years. Now, Dean has been... Uh, primarily for us, he's been an incredibly valuable voice in the mental health discussion, especially for the music industry, where artists are vulnerable on stage as well as off stage. So today, Dean, we're really happy to talk to you to see how lockdown is going for you. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us. How are you? All right. I'm okay. How are you? We're good. We're good. good. So tell us what happened to you in lockdown. Did it was there a story involved? Well, like, has it stopped you from doing what you normally do? Tell us what your lockdown experience was like. Um, well, when lockdown initially hit, um, you know, of course, it took a financial hit just of upcoming gigs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, for me, I probably, we probably lost about 10 to 15 grand in, in upcoming shows, which... Yeah, that's a small number in comparison to a lot, what a lot of other people are dealing with. Um, but I hate overheads. So I keep myself with minimal overheads. And luckily, I in this situation, it's, it's, it's paid off for me quite well to have no overheads. Excellent. Um, I went and did some painting work and construction stuff with a friend of mine. Um, for a little while and it was fun you know it's it's been fun doing stuff like that i i i do that even when it's not locked down you know it's it's good to get out and and uh get your hands dirty i think plus i learned so much on that i've become a handyman around the house because i know how to use a drill now you know <laughs> multi-talented yeah but uh in the last probably week or so it all yeah, it all sort of boiled down and having the industry shut down and then not knowing whether, you know, I started to get all these thoughts about whether we'd hit a, a financial depression because um, all the businesses are failing and if the government runs out of coin and all these unanswered questions, um, you know, and then my depression started to, to catch up on me. And, I, and I'd been working quite hard. I'd gone from doing uh, 10 releases in 10 weeks to then finalising an album for my father who have been producing for the last couple of years. Then after that, I went doing construction work for probably a fortnight and then was construction work during the day and then recording at night. And it all just kind of... I just burn myself out. It's what I do. I try and... I, I manage it a lot better than I used to, but I... I'm a bit of a workaholic at times and it sort of boils down. I ended up a quivering mess on the floor. So yeah, we relate. the depression kind of got in and was just gave me extremely negative uh, views on, on life. And as it does, you know, I've been, I, I wouldn't say suffering. I don't like the term I've been suffering from depression because that's, you're playing the victim then, I think. I consider myself, I've been fighting depression for 20 years now. Yeah. I'm 28 years old. <laughs> it's like the majority of my life so far, I've been fighting this stuff and researching it. And I mean, for the first 10 years, I didn't know what it was. You know, I was mm -hmm. very, I just thought it, I was, everyone was like that or I just felt lonely and yeah, it was just a strange feeling. Um, as I got older, though, it got worse. And yeah. um, when I was 18, I was diagnosed with um, severe clinical depression. Mm -hmm. And we tried, we did a you know run of medication and, and tried that to get me back on top. And that didn't work. I went off it because, it, you know, it wasn't working. The, the medication wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and then... I had another, I had another crash. I call them crashes or a meltdown. Uh, when I was probably twenty, so then I had to, I went in again. I went on a different medication that worked, 
<clears throat> I stayed on that for a while. And then when I was 22, yeah, I was, I was 22 and I went off them, which was extremely difficult uh, and like physically painful. Very odd experience to go off these antidepressants. Made every muscle and joint and bone hurt like wow. agony uh, and nauseous, like uh, the kind of nauseous you feel if you drink, if, if you drink like way too much and you're over 25. Yep. <laughs> you know, when like you're over 25 and you start to get that poisoned, nauseous yep. hangover feeling. We yeah, get that. It's like that. <laughs> yeah. For a fortnight, for two weeks straight, uh, it was like that. It's really, really horrible. I, I didn't realize at the time that there were rehab clinics available to help people get off these things. Um, yes, mm. very valuable. Yeah, if I were to do that again, I would definitely be going to one of those clinics because yes holy, get some yeah. help oh man it yeah. was crazy uh but i tried to do a natural thing so i went off those that was with guidance from no that wasn't with guidance from my doctor she was mad at me for doing that but um i wanted to try a natural way so i, I had a dietitian working with me and i had uh, a, a sleep routine and eating and training and things like that and even with all that i was always on the edge I was very fragile uh, and then touring started up again and I did in a weekend, like in a small window, I did a, a show in Melbourne, um, then flew to Adelaide in time to walk on stage like I missed sound check and everything, just flew in, did the gig, then the next day the band went back to Melbourne, I went to Perth, played a festival took the red eye back in time to get into Melbourne for sound check for a show there. Uh, and then the following day, like during that gig, I started to feel a bit sick. I had a cough. So this cough's pretty serious cough, you know, for just a, for any other coughs I've had, it was hurting quite a bit. Uh, and the next day it's full blown pneumonia. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I nearly died. It was wow. seriously very close. Um, and my mental health went down big time then. This is yes. 2015. Early Understandable. 2015. Yeah. yeah. So I went back on the meds, still on them, haven't missed, haven't missed a day since. They, they allow, uh, the ones that I'm on seem to allow me to feel, which is nice. The first ones I tried, I couldn't feel. It was like I functioned at whatever milligram they had me on. Wow. Whereas this, huh. this stuff... This stuff, I can be sad, I can be happy, I can get excited, okay. nervous. Which it's is still important. still not as good as uh, being a healthy. You know, I'd rather not be on them, but I would much rather take them than uh, be laying on the floor suicidal because it's, yeah. it's that bad for me, you know. Yes. When it, when, if I'm not taking these things, I can't move. I want to, and I try as hard as I can, but my body won't move. Um, that so. I don't understand. It's an incredible story, Dean, because you're not alone. There's so many artists that share the same experiences with you, share the same pain, and your, I think your journey has been inspiring to them because they can sort of take heart that you're being so public about it, you're sharing your experience, which is helping them to, number one, feel like they're not alone, Number two, mm. they're not crazy. It's act it's an actual disease. Real. And number three, there are pathways to recovery, which is, I think, so great to hear your voice in that regard. And I guess to my question, um, in obviously you've, you've had a bit of a crash, as you've called it, in lockdown. How do you feel in terms of when things open up again? How do you feel in terms of, I guess, how the music industry is actually going to recover? Because that's going to be weighing on your mind as well because there's so many, I guess, unknowns and so much uncertainty. Mm. Well, I, I think there's, you've got to decipher first whether it's you thinking or your depression thinking because the two are vastly different. Um, Good point. <clears throat> if my depression was thinking, it would tell me that uh, we're going to hit a massive financial crisis and and millions and millions of people will be without a home and landlords will have these empty houses and people are sleeping out in front of them. Yep. And Agreed. it's not going to be a live music scene for a decade. That's what my depression tells me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I have to then chip myself, you know. It's a constant battle of you, these thoughts that are like, this is what's going to be. And you go, no, no, no. 
Mm. Piss off. Yeah. <laughs> Just piss yeah. off. It's not how it's going to be. Um, because we don't know how it's going to be. So you just got to, I, I try and talk to the depression as if it's a, another person, you know, and, and abuse that, abuse it, you know, tell it to piss off, tell it to go away, you know, in whatever way you can. Mine is a lot, there's a lot more French involved in my deliveries. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we hear you. <laughs> yeah. It works. Uh, but you've got to try and figure out, you know, whether it's that's actually your view or whether that's depression's view. Yes. Very uh, my view my view is that this is a time for the Australian industry to finally flourish again after so long of the LA invasion. Um, we've been stuck getting Los Angeles music crammed down our throats for the last 10, 15 years. It's like if it's if it comes out of Los Angeles, we'll play it. It's like, okay. What about the people here? And you've got like one station that'll play Australian artists, mm -hmm. uh, but only if they sell out to sound like all the other artists that are floating around within that vibe. And then mm -hmm. people in that group have got their heads right up their own ass and they think they're really cool. And you're like, dude, you're following a trend. You're writing music to follow a trend. That's not what cool is. Cool is being you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what cool, cool is. Being, being what you. your heart wants you to do. That's, what cool is it's not it's not going and and writing a song to try and get it on that station and or you know conforming conforming's not cool you know your bank account finds it cool but for you personally i don't think it's very good for the soul uh many times i wish that i was into pop music you know i, I really really despise it i can't listen to pop i, I can't stand it um that's just me yeah. There's people that are, and I was like, imagine if I was a pop artist who loved pop, how good would that be? You know, you'd be, because that's, this is the time that they're flourishing. Like there's this mm -hmm. popular style of music. If you love that music and you were getting to perform and write that music, how good. Um, so I, I think that the industry, as far as touring, is going to have a lot of Australian bands touring and not many international bands. Yes, and 100%. Yeah. I think that's a good thing because there's so many yes. great, great artists and bands that are floating around that don't get on the bill at Falls Festival or, or um, Splendor or any of those. They don't get on those bills, but they're, they're brilliant. And it's like just because they don't fit that mould uh, in the past means get a day job, uh, and sell your music to your friends and family because yep. the radio is not going to support you. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think maybe uh, maybe we've got a chance now to get things back to kind of where they were in the 70s and 80s where Australia had a music scene without a hell of a lot of international uh, inundation, you know? No, love it. I love it. Manny. Maybe I'll play a big part of that too. Dean, yeah. um, may I say, um, we're very proud to be working with you. I think you espouse the values that we all think in both spheres, the mental health sphere, because it is what it is, and you've acknowledged, and having an acknowledgement that you have some form of affliction that you can control, like is the method to actually controlling it, and from a creative point of view, we need the Dean Rays of the world in the music industry to physically say exactly what everybody else is thinking because mm -hmm. it's vitally important that we don't, don't just subscribe to one mechanism or one sound or one direction of the music industry. It's, it's the creative that we need to, uh, like, I guess, to progress, you know, real music to make things live, to create against the mechanisms that, you know, like I, like I think that become the... the They've industrialised creativity. Absolutely. They're trying, they're trying to industrialise creativity. You can to an extent that it loses its soul. The whole point of creativity is that you are getting an essence of that person's soul mm. when you hear it. Absolutely. But then you industrialise that and you lose that because it's like, it's like uh, the, they say the cookie cutter. Mm. You know, everyone's the same sound, the same sound, because that sound works. And the advertisers, they like 
that yeah. sound because people Correct. can listen to that when they're driving to work. There's, like, there's yeah. a lot of stuff people can listen to when they drive to work that isn't an, a Los Angeles sound or something you'd hear in a club. Like, yeah. I'm hearing this stuff at the moment that's just, it's primarily produced for young, a young female demographic. You know, it's that, you know, the Beatles had love songs and stuff, yes, but people in their 40s and 50s could relate to those songs as well. Whereas this other stuff's very simple and there's not much depth to it and that's cool, but why does everyone have to listen to that at the shops? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to the supermarket and hear that stuff. Put on a wider demographic of stuff, you know. It's very narrow. It's strange. It's like you, when I was a kid... You'd hear like you'd hear songs uh, on the radio, and there'd be different songs at nightclubs. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always radio nightclubs same songs. There was songs that were nightclub friendly, some crossed over, and some were radio friendly. Would tour their their circuits and stuff like that. Whereas now it seems like all the mainstream songs on radio, uh, club tracks, mm -hmm. and I think that's a. That's Keep just going. a whole, there's all these different, especially Australia, there's like four or five different stations that play this one genre. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. shit. There, there is popular music out there that doesn't sit in that mould. It's still mm -hmm. popular music, could be pop, you know, like uh, uh, Bears Den is a band. They've, they've got stuff that's really mainstream friendly, but never, I've never heard them on the radio yet. So maybe maybe it's a positive this this COVID lockdown because the borders are the borders are shut now. Internal borders may open, therefore people can start touring. And um, it just depends on whether the Australian culture has decided whether they have missed going to live gigs enough to help live exactly. music really get off the ground again. Exactly. It's an exciting time. It really is an exciting time now for the Australian music industry. Out of adversity will come opportunity, and you're mm. at the fore. I see you at the forefront of that because you're not frightened to to deviate from the norm. It's as simple as that. I, I, I really mm. see that. No, that's great. Yeah, I've never been never been in, in the normal like. Uh, even as a kid in school, I was on the outer. I wasn't. I had trouble fitting in and being normal per se, but always on the outer. I was never, never really a popular kid till my last two years of schooling. Uh, and I think that's just because I developed a sense of humour. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Oh, sense of humor. Yeah. Mark. Well, obviously with uh, everything starting to ease back now, Dean, and, you know, we can go down to the pub and get a schooner and that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel starting to get a little bit larger. Um, what are you looking forward to most when uh, when we can all get back to the thing or back to doing the things we love the most and performing live? Um, I'm more concerned about all the uh, small businesses getting back on top. To be honest, mm -hmm. um, I've been self isolating for the last three years, man. I yeah, yep. I'm comfortable yeah. that way. Yeah, you know, I hide away from people. I like to make music and. I've got to I keep my, my friends group small, you know. Yeah. used to keep it large and have less meaningful connections, whereas now I keep it small and have deeper connections. I prefer that. Absolutely. And I like being alone. I'm quite content with it now. Um, so for me, I'm, you know, the pubs, are, I haven't gone to the pub. I make my own moonshine. I love it. I <laughs> happily stay home. Really? Um, I'm not a, I'm not much of a socialiser as far as going to the pub. I think this is not my my scene anymore. I overdid it when I was younger. Yeah. So um, happy to stay at home, but I just I'd love to see these these families who have got kids and businesses that have had to pay thousands of dollars worth of rent mm -hmm. try and start to make that back. Yeah. Um, Great. You know, I'd love to get back on the road too. Um, but at the end of the day, like I don't really classify me being on the road as as important as people uh, getting their their businesses back up. Yeah. So 100%, yeah, I think that's I'm looking forward to seeing a bit of hustle and bustle going on again. You know, seeing cafes oh, and restaurants are yeah. full. I want to go to a restaurant and 
want to take Haley out, and then the restaurant says, "Sorry, we're full. You'd have to wait for an hour and a half." And mm. and it's full because it's at capacity, not because of social distancing. You know, that's yeah. that's what I'm looking forward to. No, that's great. It's great, and I think you know once your new album, um, you're because you're working on something at the moment, aren't you? You're going to be releasing something in a couple of months. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Dean? Yeah, we we started working on a thing. When I say we, as uh, me and I've got a, a kind of a management team, um, a lady in Townsville and a guy that lives not far from me here. Um, and the three of us work on things together. Um, it's not me and the voices in my head, you know. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been working on this thing called the Four Track Sessions, uh, inspired by an album Bruce Springsteen did called Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and he recorded all these four track demos. Then they recorded them with the band, lost the vibe. They'd spent so much recording. They said, What are we going to do now? And he said, Just master the master the demos and release those <laughs> and it's really cool it's got this great concept it's just there's nothing to it it's acoustic guitar harmonica vocal um yeah, yeah they're super super organic and raw and i think i've noticed that lacking in the industry globally is this rawness oh, yeah. uh, where people especially i do a bit of producing and stuff for other people uh, and I noticed that yeah, some some acts rely heavily on Production. tuning, yeah. and they're happy with like. No, if you can't sell me the song on your own, either a cappella or with an instrument, the song's not good enough. Yeah, agreed. You know, the song has to deliver. You know, the, a lot of these hits, a lot of the big hits out there, they can play that on a piano or a guitar and sing it, and you still listen to it and go, "That's a hit." Yeah. So whether I like pop or not doesn't matter. I still listen to some of these songs and, and there are probably 40, 50% of them. I'm like, they're brilliantly structured songs. You know? And if you did just play it with the vocal and an instrument, you'd know it was a hit. It's still, you know, Absolutely. some of them questionable. Sure. But yeah, um, been producing and I, I wanted to get, this uh, this rawness and authenticity into a project, and also get some songs out of the out of the drawer that have just been sitting there, and I haven't really had a use for. I've now got a, a, a use for them. Um, so yeah, I've you, I've limited logic to a four in. I uh, created a bunch of rules, and you, you're allowed four input channels. That's not four instruments. That's four microphones. Right. Basically. You could have. You know, people are like, oh, so you could have drums, bass, guitar, and vocal. And you're like, well, no. You could have a drum. <laughs> you could have a kick drum. Uh, and if you have a snare drum, that's another track. So then you've got a vocal and a guitar. That's all you could really get out of it. So right. the challenge is making it as full as possible with minimal, minimal input channels. Um, you're only allowed to do two vocal takes, mm -hmm. and you can edit between those takes and get a comp uh, and you're allowed to automate effects and stuff like that, right. which is stuff that you couldn't really do Great. on, Sounds on fantastic. A, yeah, on a port of studio is a bit difficult to mm. automate things like that. Great. So it's more about, it was, for me, it was like the vocal. It was the challenge of delivering a good, honest vocal that was in pitch to the best you could do in two yep. takes, which means just practicing the bastard. It's not hard. Just mm. practice it. Like, yeah. spend, instead of doing 10 takes at it, why don't you do 10 run-throughs until you've nailed it and then yeah. record two takes and it's like, they're bang on. Great. Um, no melodyne. No melodyne. No tuning. No auto-correction. None of no that. No auto be raw. raw. As soon yeah. as you put melodyne on a track, it, it brings it. out the, the air in someone's voice and you can tell straight away that it's... It's been tuned like. Duh, 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 duh. Yeah, I hate that. I hate that because what melodyne does is it takes away the blue notes, which are the notes that are sit in between pitches, where they're a little bit flat or a little bit sharp, but they're like that because that's how you felt when you sang. Right, that's and that's great. melodyne can 
piss off. If we, you know, that's where, <laughs> where I sit with Melodyne. If you can't sing in tune, get out of the industry and stop making a mess. You know, well, sing in tune, work and sing in tune, I think is a, is a big thing. Well, um, look, we're, we're very excited about this album and, and especially if you're going to be touring later this year or early next year. But, look, I, I think the one thing I've really loved you say today is cool is being you. I think that's our, that's our theme mm -hmm. for the rest of the day, cool is being you. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. But, Dean, it was such a great pleasure to talk to you, to hear all about, I think, the philosophy of your art and your craft. I think that is key with what you do and hear about your struggles and how you're actually facing it and your, your working way through it is incredibly inspiring. So well done, dude. And thank you so thank much you. for talking to us today. And we will stay in That's touch and right. I'll put all your information in so everyone knows what you're doing. And we look forward to talking to you again very soon. Dean Ray, thank, thank you, you so Dean much Ray. for talking to us today. Legend. No worries. Legend. Thank you so much. Legend. Cheers.